You're listening to the Royal Flying Doctor Service podcast for the Queensland section. This episode is brought to you by the Small Talk Big Difference campaign. Hello and welcome to the Small Talk Big Difference podcast. I'm Dr. Tim Driscoll, Manager for the Outback Mental Health Service for Royal Flying Doctor Service Queensland section. Today I'll be speaking with Eddie Cowie, an SES local controller from Rockhampton, who has 30 years experience in Queensland's emergency services. Eddie lost his 1,000 tree lightshed orchard in the 2019 bushfires. He lost his livelihood while helping to defend others' homes, including his parents' neighbouring property. Eddie joins us today to share more about his experience. Eddie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tim. So before we begin, Eddie, um, we like to, to kick these podcasts off with a small talk starter. Um, so today I'd like to you to tell me um, what successes are you most proud of? Uh, look, my successes, I think, with all of my emergency services and the many different um, emergencies and disasters I've been involved in, I think my greatest success would have to be my family. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a proud, um, you know, I'm a proud dad um, who has a very close family network, and uh, and for a number of years I was a stay-at-home dad for uh, my two sets of twins. So we had four babies in 20 months, and that was a bit of a challenge. And um, so my wife opted to go back to work, and I became that stay-at-home dad and uh, loved every moment of it until my kids went to school. So I think for me, it's my family, and um, and that's what I'm most proud of. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about and explain uh, what happened when the fires hit in 2019? Yeah, look, when the fires hit on uh, um, in November of 2019, uh, we, we were aware that there were some catastrophic uh, weather conditions that would make any fire that started in any location within our central Queensland area a bad fire. And, um, and there was an absolute total fire ban um, happening on the days preceding and certainly on the Saturday of that fire. Um, unfortunately, a fire didn't start. It was started from a small camp um, fire and that fire very quickly got out of control. And, um, and subsequently um, the fire started to uh, take hold very quickly and within, within 10 minutes of that fire starting, it had started to, um, to burn down homes. Um, from, from the fire starting, um, it was um, about lunchtime um, and that fire very quickly started to spread over a very wide front. Um, and as it um, was pushed along by extremely um, strong winds, the conditions were just so um, so right for a catastrophic fire that uh, it became very evident that the fire was uncontrollable. There were numerous numerous fire crews that were being responded, both from a rural aspect and also from an urban aspect. Um, and it was about that time that Queensland Police started to try to get in front of that fire and and uh, block off roads and evacuate people. And it was at that time that the uh, SCS were activated. Uh, initially, it was a local SES um, group at Yapoon, um, but we realised that the this particular event would exceed all of their resources. So um, at that point, I then became involved in activating teams from Rickhampton, and uh, we put all our resources into essentially supporting the evacuation of homes that were in front of that fire and trying to block down what roads we could to only allow emergency services into that um, fire area and people who needed to evacuate out. Um, and obviously that fire then um, spread along a very wide area very, very quickly. Um, and it was probably about that time that I started to identify that that fire, even though it started more than 15 kilometres away from where my property was, I realised that we were basically somewhere within the line of that fire. and. In the early afternoon, probably about um, three o'clock, I handed over my SES incident um, control vest that I had. I'm, I'm an SES local controller and handed that over to one of my deputies um, uh, and essentially um, left my position and headed through um, one of the, the back roads that I know well to try to get to my property um, where my father had already been contacted and we'd enacted our fire plan. And before we knew it, um, uh, we were under attack. So there were lots of issues that happened on the way through there. There were homes that I was seeing that were on fire. There were people who were still in their homes that were on fire. 
um, I was trying to evacuate those people out and send them to a to an evacuation route that would be safe. Um, my problem was I actually didn't know how quick that fire had had um, taken hold in some areas, and I was hoping that um, those people were going to make it out um, as safely as they could. Um, clearly, by the time I got through to my property, we'd already started our fire plan um, to to enact that. Um, we had. Um, you know, four types of water backup. We had four types of um, power backup. Um, we ensured that our property was totally um, as fireproof as what we could. Um, but as we soon found out, that fire was absolutely, absolutely out of control. And um, where we started to fight it, the fire coming into our neighbours' properties and attempted to save their properties, um, it ultimately, um, it ultimately, there was nothing we could do. Um, and that fire very quickly engulfed my property initially. Um, and as my father and I tried very hard to try to put that fire out, uh, it became evident that we had lost control. We had no control over what really was happening. And subsequently from then, um, we, we basically um, retreated from my property back to my father's property and focused on trying to save his, his um, home and whatever other resources and, and assets we could. Um, and yeah, and, and from there, um, we, we fought that fire for many, many hours. Um, we, we did save his his house. The fire burnt right up to the stairs. Um, by the time the fire got to us, we had essentially lost our tractor um, that had the water on the back. We'd lost all power, all backup water. Our tanks had caught on fire. Our poly pipes had um, caught on fire. Um, so we had no water left. To the point where we were using wet hessian bags where we'd filled up um, troughs um, around the house with water um, and essentially we had a, um, a blower and we blew the fire out so um, in the early hours of, of um, Sunday morning we finally got the fire out and um, and the rest is I suppose um, history we we had essentially a, a full burnout of our property um, we'd lost um, a thousand mature lychee trees on, on my farm, all of our assets, uh, cold rooms, um, containers, um, um, sheds, fences, irrigation, absolutely nothing was left. It was 100% burn. Um, all of our equipment, quads, every piece of um, equipment that we had was, was burnt. Um, my father lost about a thousand trees, um, custard apples, lychees, longans, mangoes. Um, and, um, and quite a lot of his um, assets as well, but luckily we were able to save two of his sheds um, and his house. So um, take the good with the bad. It's, it's quite something to go through. It's a huge amount of loss. Um, so what, what was the impact on, on you emotionally during that time or immediately after and sort of even in the months after that? It must have been quite the ordeal to go through. Yeah, look, it, look, it, was, a, um, it was a challenging ordeal. Um, uh, basically, we had a thousand mature trees that had a very good crop on them. We'd ironically just put a hundred thousand dollars worth of new nets on that um, on that lychee um, um, plantation that week. It was we actually put the last net on um, the day of the fire, and then um, subsequently from that we ended up probably um, you know just realizing that that there was nothing left. Um, we had to start from scratch. So. Um, there's, I suppose, one of those things where at least um, we, when we'd been impacted by Cyclone Master in 2015 and we'd lost 477 of those trees, we still had half of our crop left and we still had a lot of our assets. And essentially um, there was a, if you want to, a half start. Um, ultimately, in the end, um, uh, with the fire, it was nothing left. So we just we basically had to start with less than what we had when we went onto the farm for sure. There wasn't even a fence standing, so... Yep, so it's, um, that's the challenge. That is a challenge, a massive challenge. And, and what sort of steps did you take to, to start that process, you know, back from recovery after such a disaster? Look, um, you know, starting the recovery was um, a broader challenge mm. um, in the fact that I, um, I I think you don't know where to start, you know. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, I, I think that you end up really doing nothing for the first... Um, month, you know, you, you basically you, just, you can't do anything. That it, it doesn't matter what you think is going to be that recovery. You actually don't know whether or not 
um, you need to start with power, whether you start with water, because without um, the power back on, we can't run our water. Without our water, we can't grow our trees. Mm. So you really have to get back to the very basics of what do I need to start, and that's basically how how we did it. So within a month, we ended up, um, you know, um, it, with with a lot of work from my father, we sat back and looked at um, what our, our our first priorities and. Um, is it worth us rebuilding this farm? And if it if it isn't, do we just walk away and, and leave it as it is, or um, you know, do we actually look at um, giving it another shot and um, and and basically knowing that whatever we do, we're going to be five years away from any form of income whatsoever and a lot of money to get to that point. So we ultimately decided that that's what we were going to do, and we rebuilt. So. During during that time, is is there anything you did to to make sure you stayed well yourself? I mean, there's a lot of pressure on you in that rebuilding phase. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, look, I suppose the crunch of um of of any major um, life impacting challenge uh, like the fire is, um, you know, what does it mean for myself? Um, you know, I, I must admit, I was I was I had a lot of challenges at that time, and ultimately, um. You know, I I know that I probably initially didn't handle those well. You know, I, I probably didn't talk to some of the people that I should have been talking to, and, and ultimately from there, um, I think it took me probably about um, two months to really start to um, open up and, and and know that I needed to be talking to somebody, and and um, and that happened um, really in a in a conversation with a friend of mine, um, I, I'm ex-ambulance and um, as a result I've got a very good friend who was a peer supporter to whom um, in my background with ambulance there was a whole lot of um, opportunity. So to, to, to sit down and talk to, to, to him and I actually utilised a, a conversation over a coffee one day to actually sit down and, and really talk about um, what the fire meant for me from a from an emotional point of view, um, as well as from a financial point of view. Of course, um, for me, both were running hand in hand with each other. Um, you know, when when I realised that there was going to be a fairly significant financial impact upon me, um, and the fact that I would have to draw some of the funds out that would generally go into my family and the roof over my my family's house, um, that that house that you know ultimately gives my family protection. How could you know? How would that impact them? Knowing that I probably needed to do some of that to get my farm back on track, and likewise the emotional, um, the emotional toll that um, that it would take me five years to get the farm back on track was was certainly playing on my mind as well. So um, it became a little bit of a vicious circle for me, and until I really sat back and looked at how I was going to do this and do it with some rationale, um, and, and I think that's where that conversation with with um, with with um, my friend came into it and and we started a regular conversation and that regular conversation um, you know probably happened initially um, every three or four days to the point where at a point in time it was every day that that we were just having this this chat and there was no real um, rationale um, it wasn't like I was going to a counselor it wasn't like I was I was I was talking to a psychologist. Um, it, it, it was really, um, it was really about. I had someone to talk to and, and basically um, get my pressures, um, get my pressures off um, my scenario. So, well, the other thing that, that happened was the same week that the fires hit, you graduated with a bachelor's in emergency management with a focus on crisis and disaster, crisis and disaster management. Um, did, did that equip you in any way to, to deal with well the disaster and the aftermath? Look, look. Um, to some extent, it did. You know, I um, ironically did a, um, a subject on complex emergencies. Um, it was more so uh, based around the humanitarian side of, of emergency management, disaster management. Um, but but it talks about um, some of those compounding issues that create um, those broader challenges for those that are within emergency management within within your specific field. And I think that, um, you know, when I was um, doing a lot of my study around emergency management, um, it took me into another zone that I hadn't actually been part of as, as my everyday SES 
uh, emergency management, employment professions have, have had me in, actually took me to an area where I started to think very broadly about what do we do when you've got those complex emergencies. And, and I suppose uh, for me, um, preceding um, the fires, we actually had had a significant drought that was impacting us. And the thing about the drought is it, it's a very slow disaster. You actually, it sneaks up on you very, very slowly over a number of months and or in our case years. Um, so we were already sort of looking at um, what the drought would mean to us more long term. Um, so we were already trying to manage that as well as um, uh, put ourselves um, into a, a better position with, with the cyclone um, and what that had done to us to, to build our property back stronger. But when the fire came through, obviously there was a whole lot of compounding issues. So um, ultimately, um, what it meant was um, that I had this broader challenge um, that I suppose when it comes to that compound emergencies, I'd, I'd actually looked at it, but on a more um, theory based. And, and here I was now realizing that I, really, I was gonna have to put that into, um, into practice in my own life. Um, probably not to the full extent of what a, a true complex emergency in a potentially an area like um, uh, um, Yemeni might, um, might, might curtail with, with a whole lot of very complex emergencies. But in our case, um, that there were still disasters and emergencies in their own way, um, just on a scale which I suppose I could, I could manage. So it sounded like it was quite a help in a, in a pretty significant way, having that, that background and also you know, that additional training. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what, um, what it did was um, it provided me with some of the education that I didn't have beforehand. And um, an education, as I found in, in, um, in my emergency services world, is really quite an important, um, an important tool. You know, you don't know what you don't know till you know it. And, um, and certainly, um, I could probably say that I'm relatively, um, I'm relatively well um, aware of the different hazards that we have within different communities. You know, we talk about an all hazards approach when we try to um, prepare for disasters and emergencies. And in knowing what those disasters are, we also um, need to understand what risks would come with those disasters. And and um, and so I had a really good opportunity of probably being aware of a lot of those risks myself and what that meant. Um, so all I could probably um, suggest is that, um, you know, um, having a good um, knowledge base, whether you, whether you happen to know everything now, <laughs> where you think you know everything now, whether or not someone comes along with an, a, a little bit more um, information that actually helps you broaden those skills um, is really important. For sure, yeah. I guess the the other thing that I'd be interested in knowing is that obviously sometimes these disasters do have an impact on people's mental health, and and sometimes and people really do struggle after going through a natural disaster. Um, is there any advice you could give them in terms of what what might be helpful, what you've seen be helpful previously with with people whose mental health has been knocked as a result of going through a, a significant natural natural disaster? It's a really good question, actually, and and I, I suppose one that I've I've, I've felt firsthand um, with with the disasters. I I think that, um, and, I, and I see it a lot in the farming industry, I think, um, that as well as other industries and, and other communities where, um, you know, natural disasters um, can have a significant impact upon people's mental health. Um, you know, I, I think also that um, the financial strains that people already have can be impacted by those disasters and then in and then it, it, it then compounds what might be happening from a, an emotional or psychological point of view. And, and, and I think the best advice I can give is, is particularly for those that are on the land, those that might be in those um, remote rural communities or even um, that broader community is, um, you know, you, you, I thought that I could do it on my own. I thought I could do it without needing to talk to anyone at all, but I... I can honestly say that until I started to talk to somebody who was just there to listen to what my challenges were, and and then I found that they were actually able to guide me into um, some some appropriate counselling um, because I didn't actually know how bad I was until it was brought to my attention. So it started off with just a simple conversation with somebody to whom I trusted, 
Um, and, and what it led then to was talking to somebody who was more um, experienced in that field of, of, um, of mental health. And um, I don't think it, had made, it, it makes me any weaker to have to say, you know, what I did have to talk to somebody. Um, it actually, I think, um, ha has made me stronger. It's part of that, that um, conversation we just had that there were some things I didn't know until somebody told me. And, and that it also is in relation to some of the tools and some of those grounding techniques that I needed to keep me focused on what was important and for me that was the real rebuilding of my farm so that my family would be safe um, and they'd have um, hopefully that roof over their head for a lot longer and so being able to talk to somebody in a very professional um, in a very professional way and also guiding me into some of those other support mechanisms around um, you know, um, Category C funding for recovery. Um, it made it a lot easier for me to be able to um, get some of the confusion that was in my head to one side and just deal with the facts and what was going to be needed to actually help me get back on that track too. So um, for me, that professional um, conversation was something that ultimately, um, you know, impacted me positively in, 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 in a way that I don't think I would have had had I not had that first conversation with a cup of tea and a mate. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the way it tends to start, isn't it? I mean, no one goes to a, a psychologist, for example, first up. It's always those people immediately around us that we trust, and that's always our first line of support, and that's where most of our support comes from. Um, and like you were saying, you know, often we don't see um, that we're going downhill necessarily. It's other people that know us, which is so important to look out for each other and have those conversations. It's, it's, it's really key. Um, and I, I think one of the other things is that you're, you're mentioning sort of, you know, counselling and, and the idea of weakness, but it really should be seen as, as part of being resilient. It's, you know, it's the same way as, you know, you, you put a fire break down, you know, you, if you, you go through something that's really, you know, it's a really hard thing to go through, the same thing, it's prevention. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's all part of a, a resilient approach. So I hope we change the way we see that. I don't know if we're there yet, but we're probably a little way off, but I'd like to see us get there. I, I, like I've really appreciated your time tonight, Eddie. Um, some really great insights into you know what the experience was like, um, but also you know where that support can come from and how you can push through those really challenging times. Um, it's been really really valuable, and I'm sure the the listeners will certainly appreciate those insights. Um, and, and you know particularly the importance of you know talking to those people that are you know right in your in your life, those people that are that are around, and they're they're the people that offer the most support to us, and make sure that we're looking out for each other. Um, so important to, to talk, so useful. Um, so I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, and I, I will uh, do a bit of a recap of this, um, going over some of those key messages for the audience, um, but really some great takeaways. And I certainly appreciate your time tonight. And uh, for those people listening, certainly go along and have a look at the, the website at smalltalkbigdifference.com.au um, and certainly have a look at some of those resources, uh, other stories and also practical strategies that you can use um, you know, when we are impacted by disaster um, because it does have significant impacts on many of us. Um, we're in a, in a state where we will be facing more of these, so it's good to be prepared. And I certainly appreciate all your insights, Eddie, and, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Royal Flying Doctor Service podcast for the Queensland section. The Small Talk Big Difference campaign is proudly funded by the Commonwealth and Queensland governments through the disaster recovery funding arrangements. If you would like to know more, you can go to the campaign website, smalltalkbigdifference.com.au. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, keep in touch by subscribing.